right. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to Pep Talk. I'm your host, Leon Theodore. Pep Talks are frank conversations about the state of education today. Joining to the conversation today is Christica Harper. How are you, Christica? Christica, adjunct professor at Concordia University, coach and advocate for Black collegiate males. Welcome, Christica. The disparities in our school discipline system, both nationally and here in Dallas, has been highlighted by recent current events, the use of zero tolerance practices and the over disciplining of youth of color, specifically black youth, has continued the flow of black boys and girls into the school to prison pipeline. Our educational system spends vast amounts of money for security services and minuscule amounts on the mental and emotional well-being of our youth. Systemic racism, racist practices and policies have impacted communities of color, but specifically black communities, creating wealth and achievement gaps that spill into our school system. Implicit bias from teachers, counselors and administration continually criminalize black student behavior while dismissing and minimizing the same behavior in other students. Zero tolerance policies and practices Practices are proven not to change students' behavior, but to increase aggression and acting out. The call for restorative justice programming in schools has reached a crescendo. It's time for us to heed this call. Today's topic is implicit bias, teachers, and referrals. And uh, we're, I'd like to introduce my guest, Kriska Harper. How are you today? I'm great. I'm blessed. How are you? Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you for joining me today, Chris, Christopher. I want to talk about implicit bias um, and how that affects our students specifically, especially youth of color and black and brown youth. Um, and understanding that what in, implicit bias is is that it's a, a look at when we have attitudes or, or thoughts or prejudices towards uh, groups of people, just based off of our perception of them, how we think about them. Uh, it's not specific to race, it's not specific to gender, anything. It's based off of how we perceive and what we think. So um, it's important to recognize that it's not just a black white thing. It's just that we all have our biases and we have to, we have to be emotionally intelligent to work, with, work on those and how we approach it, especially in the educational system. So Christica, what I wanna do today is start off with uh, you giving us a little history about yourself, why you, why, what you do and who you are. Okay, well, I always like to start off by saying I am a, a little country girl. I'm from Waco, Texas. You know, uh, a lot of people know Waco and, and we have recently, I think, just expanded our brand. If you've ever seen the show Fixer Upper with, with Chip and Joanna Gaines, our brand is amazing. So I'm from that, that city that you see on TV. But Waco, Texas, born and raised. I actually played basketball throughout my life. So I am a, a hooper, as they say. I play ball. And I have always been involved, though, in the community. My, my grandparents, my mentors, they were always involved in the community. So I was always either playing basketball or doing some sort of service. And so I was raised that way in a very, very loving family. And I went on to play basketball in college as well. So play a little college basketball. And in college, you start learning more about yourself without the, the, the investment in dogma and perceptions of other people. You start to learn a lot of things, and, and I started learning, learning how much I love people and 
how much I love service as a profession. We start getting introduced to different areas. And so I wanted to commit my life to serving young people and serving our community. And, and it started in college. And so I was in a sorority, doing a lot of things uh, around the state of Texas, Arkansas, and, and really the country, and just fell in love with it and committed my life to it. So since undergrad, I've done various things throughout K through 12 in higher education, from youth care counseling to recruitment to career development to my last stint as a fundraiser. And now I am teaching and advising. And so it has been a blessing. So that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you. Uh, so you've covered every field that we've had. We've been K through 12, collegiate, which is good. You know, I, I had someone ask me today, well, yesterday actually, well, why did you get a college professor? I mean, you know, to, to talk about bias when mainly we think about uh, K through 12. You know, but it's, it's important to see that some of the things that our kids are experiencing, they carry through. So, you know, you have to, and, and it also affects us at a, at a collegiate level as well. And it's not, again, it's not just uh, a race thing, but what happens, what we're experiencing and what we see is that black kids are pushed more into the, are pushed more frequently into the school to prison pipeline. They receive more discipline. There are harsher discipline uh, practices. They're kicked out of school more often. So, and when you think about that, that changes how a person perceives themselves, how are you perceive themselves. So, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your history. Uh, I know we talked briefly about your family and that your father was incarcerated. Um, could you, can you go a little bit into that, how that made you feel, how that changed your, your perception of self and did that affect how teachers per, uh, perceived you as well or interacted with you? Thank you for asking me that. As I sit in the seat of someone who is in front of a classroom, holding the title and position of faculty member, even on the adjunct level, I am in front of the class teaching and I have the opportunity to, to invest my biases, to invest my perceptions, my words, I have that time, 50 minutes every Friday to do that. That alone shows the power of an educator. Because if it not had been, if it wasn't for them who invested that time and, and their biases, if it were not for them, I wouldn't be in front of that classroom. So I want to start there and then go back. Because on paper, and when you look at me or when you talk to me, you don't know some of those things that happened from age zero to 21. You would have never guessed it, but because of educators. So a little bit about that backstory, growing up, you that wasn't abnormal for people to talk about someone was locked, locked up. And that, that's what you would say. Yeah. That was not normal. That was a normal conversation. So when we talk about it now, we talk about incarceration, collateral damage, incarcerated families, all of those things. Now I have a viewpoint of it from trying to solve it. At that early stage in life as an adolescent, I thought it was a part of people's families. I thought that that was just normal. Everybody had somebody that was locked up, incarcerated. Some people say off to college. <laughs> things like that <laughs> my dad told me the other day he went to California because at that time people would go off to California or move away and so that was just kind of common back in the day so growing up I thought it was normal number one but I knew though that when you go to school you don't tell certain things to your teachers yes you don't tell them that that's happening not to try to be secretive, what stays in the home is in the home, but they knew, maybe not in an intellectual sort of way, didn't know theories, but they knew if you tell that teacher something could happen to you, to your family, or just the way that they treated you. You knew that. Some way you knew that. Yeah. So growing up, even though I had opportunities to lead. My mom was very focused on, hey, even though this is happening in our life, we want to connect you to opportunities. 
I had opportunities to travel via athletics and, and academics and, and social organization. However, there was another side to my life. So from zero to 18, I hid that. Like no one really knew that someone was incarcerated besides your, your family. And so growing up, it was something that I hid. And I didn't know it at the time, but I knew that if I told an educator, something would either happen to my family or they would treat me differently and they would not look at me the same. So I already had the indicators of what was labeled at risk at the time, but now it's called at potential, which is a beautiful thing that, that we flipped that, that term. But I already had the indicators of being at risk. I thought that when you got free and reduced lunch, I was special because my I didn't have to pay for my lunch. I didn't know that actually <laughs> legislation and policy says you can't afford it. Your mom doesn't make enough for it, X, Y, Z. So I thought I was special because I had free lunch. So I had that indicator. I had the, the single parent home. I had the, the environmental impact. I had those things. So I had all the indicators. But what was special about my loving family and a family that was thinking so far into the future had the forethought to prepare me for my future. I still had that at the same time. Yeah. And I think that's where that implicit bias comes in. You may have a student like Krista, who when she goes home, life looks different. But when she comes into class, into the classroom, you may not know that that is what her life looks like. So the, the Black experience, African-American experience, children of incarcerated uh, parents, our experiences are not monolithic. And I think we sometimes unconsciously take that because she's this, she's that. And that does not mean the same thing. And so I would offer some of those, those ideas. You know that that's important that you that you express that that they, that like you said it's not monolithic, but and and not even but let me take that out. You know the issue is is that when we see people, when we, we when we stereotype them, when we think a certain thing, uh, we hinder we hinder them. We we close off the opportunity that they have to be who they are. Um, and when, when you think of it as in terms of discipline, when a kid doesn't have the support that you had, you know, and they don't have the, the, uh, the ability to overcome the, the stressors that they have and they act out or they, they come at, you know, they present a certain way it's important that you said that it, it, it is upon the teacher, the honest lays on the teacher, to be emotionally intelligent enough to see, to understand well, or figure out what's going on with that child. Because a lot of our kids are, they don't have the support that you had. You know, you were blessed to have that, but a lot of kids don't have that. And you know, even, even myself, I had that loving, supporting family, but for me, the acting out was a way of expressing myself. And there are so many people, but it, but for a few teachers that looked and saw past the foolishness, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, you know, I think, again, nothing that I'm talking about or nothing that we're discussing is about laying blame on people. It's about understanding your responsibility. It's about being emotionally intelligent. It's about being empathetic towards the students that you were given the opportunity to shape and mold. And that's, I think, what we're talking about. You know, uh, in the current climate and the current administration, you know, we just passed a bill. I mean, there was an executive order 1776 just, just uh, signed that talks about uh, taking the blame away from um, Americans so that we don't blame white Americans for, you know, the, the racist policies. And I understand, you know, you can, that can be overwhelming, but then when you think back on what we're talking about, we have youth that come from poverty, youth that come from, from incarceration in the family, all of those things reduced and free lunch, those types of things. And if we don't take the same courtesy and kindness to respect their 
differences that what they're coming from, then, you know, they get that blame. They receive that same blame. So it, I think it just becomes the people understanding that it's, it's about being emotionally intelligent. It's about being compassionate and empathetic. And I think that's what we're lacking today when we don't look at our implicit biases and we don't think about how we cause the problems that we are seeing. So, um, you know, I, what I, I want to bring up next is in your work with Black youth um, on the collegiate level, do you still find instances that implicit biases or implicit bias from your professors, uh, do they cause issues with the, with the kids that you serve? Absolutely. So I serve in a couple of different capacities. I'm advising. So I have about 300 students that I advise. I know that sounds like a lot. I know I probably have some teachers. <laughs> on the line. I have 300, 300 students. <laughs> so I feel, feel your pain. It doesn't feel like it's in ratio. Right. But I have three, 300 students that I advise. And so advising for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the STEM fields, no technology, but that area. And also teaching and doing some program coordination and also mentoring the black males, Hispanic males, and things like that. So I'm seeing it from you choosing a major to major clustering, where all the young black men say, I'm going to major in kinesiology because that's the closest thing to basketball. <laughs> so majoring clustering to seeing how they perform in the classroom, to seeing where they are socially and emotionally. So I'm seeing it from a different angle, so, so a few different angles. And what I notice is their conversations around how they were treated in middle school and high school. What was their experience in high school and middle school? And so I get them now with them bringing in low academic performance and things like that. I'm getting them already in, in, in a state of being that says, you're going to take this low effort. You're going to take this because my teachers did, because my coaches did. So I know you will, Miss Chrisica, because <laughs> that is what I've been trained. That's what I've been trained to do. And so, for example, I know we talked briefly and you said I, I could bring this up, but I've had students who will turn in two paragraphs. And I will say, this is not enough, Joe. And they'll say, well, can't you give me something for it? And at that moment, yes, I could give them five points out of the 50. I could. I could do that. Or I can say, I understand what your experience has been. But it is at that moment I have to decide whether I want to continue to train that behavior or recognize where they are, but still keep the bar high. And that is what my experience has been. There's been a particular type of training. And I posit to say that, again, like we mentioned, it is not the fault of educators. It is not the total blame on them. But I do believe you can deploy kindness and understanding with accountability. I do believe those things can coexist. And I've had in my own experience, teammates, colleagues who believe that the student just doesn't want to work hard. The student just doesn't want to be successful. And I do not believe that. I believe that I am trained for 18 years of my life. And when I get to college, that training, that unlearning will take more than 18 days to get <laughs> out of. Yes. It takes more than a semester to unwire, to unlearn. And, and so that is what I've noticed about specifically young black males. I believe they want to be there, but I've been trained a certain way. And I just believe my position is to understand, meet them where they are, but doing some unlearning in order to help them grow. And I think, as, as the quote says, it, it's easier to train young people than repair a broken man. Yes. <laughs> so, like, yes. Very much I'm writing, I'm writing that there. 
Yeah. And I have a choice every day to lower the bar or keep the bar high, but deploy love and kindness and understanding. So it sounds like what you're saying is you're not saying that implicit bias can, we're not talking about giving a handout to students. We're not talking about accepting less than the best from students. It sounds like what you're saying is that we have to take the time to understand the students and then we have to create opportunities for them where they may need support. We have to create opportunities to uh, help them reach a certain level by holding them accountable. It's more than just being, uh, more than just saying, um, I think you're going to be, you're, you're not this because this, 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 and this, or I have this perception of you. It's understanding that you have that in order to get rid of the, you must get rid of the biases because then you're, you, you don't allow the growth of the you, right? So implicit bias is more than just how you see. It's the fact that you do have the opportunity. You do hold the future for this child. And you have to you have to see and hold accountable for what they're doing. You don't you don't hinder a kid. You you enhance a, a youth. Right, and I think it's the same way when people say, "I don't see color." I'm not <laughs> translucent. <laughs> I know you can tell that I am a black woman. <laughs> yeah. And so I I think you do see where a student is. Because I have been in the area similar, a little, not as social work, but I've been doing some youth counseling work in, in a way in a, in a youth care facility. I have to see that potentially a student has had a history of violence. I, I actually cannot ignore that. <laughs> I cannot treat you as if you do not have that habit and tendency. So I believe it's good to be aware of where someone has come from, but understanding what your purpose and position is in regards to that concern. Yes. I cannot, as, as the kids say, I cannot run up on you knowing that you don't like that and that you have a, a tendency to behave a certain way if I do that. I actually do have to know and understand where you come from. I, I do have to see that, but I believe it's when you keep me there. I believe that is a lot of the issues issues that I see. Do not keep me there. Yes, I have done that, but if your job is to train me and help me and 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 and, and train me for the next level of my life, you can't keep me there. I think it's the keeping me there that that's the issue. It's not ignoring it, in in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. You know, I the, the one thing, and I'm going to throw this in here because <laughs> we're working from home and yes. we're talking about it, right? And and unfortunately, my pup is like, you know, you, you no, have, fine. right? They always show up at the wrong time. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, you have to understand what you're working with and you have to take into account that things are there and you don't, you don't ignore them. You don't, you don't do away with them. You do make adjustments for them, though. Right. I, I believe that's what we're talking about. I believe that's where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that's what's important. You know, mm -hmm. and again, we yell a lot about implicit bias. It always ends up about race, and 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 unfortunately, it is that. And but when we talk about implicit bias, when we talk about bias, and we talk about discipline and referral. And you know that our kids are being referred three times as much. Um, you know that when once a kid is referred, that they usually have, they lessen the chances of graduating. Um, what is it that you think needs to be done? What what advice can you give to teachers? And what I want to be specific about when we're talking Dallas, especially in Dallas where the majority of the enrollment is black and brown, the majority of the enrollment is uh, 
low income um, and reduce free lunch. And then you have, I, when I was looking at data that a lot of our teachers are black teachers that are doing the referring. So we don't want to just make this about it's black students, it's white students saying that it's black, right? So we're talking implicit bias. Again, a level playing field. Can you please speak to that? Because I don't, again, I don't want this to become about race, even though it is racialized. But when you look, we still have the same problem with black and brown teachers affecting, doing, making effects in black and brown populations. So can I get your answer to that? You, you know, what comes to mind I don't know if you ever read. Did you read Dr. King's Chaos or Community? I have. Oh yeah, it's probably been try to gotta, gotta revisit that one every so often. <clears throat> but one one of the things he said early on, early on in the text, he said, dramatizing the demand of change creates fear that the work is hopeless. And that came up when you asked me that question because I wonder how often we believe that that student is hopeless because we created such a narrative that could potentially be a little dramatic the way that we viewed it. And when we look at things like that, when we look at referrals and the way that we do it, are we looking at this student and saying, this scenario, using the term dramatic, this scenario, this student is so dramatic that I personally do not feel that I can handle it. I, I wonder how much we, we view that person that way or that student that way. Like you mentioned, you were acting out. I wondered how often, if someone developed the time and capacity is also an issue, but if someone developed the, the, had the capacity and invested the time to get to know you, I wonder how often you could have been, for lack of better terms, disarmed emotionally. I wonder how often that could have happened. So I speak to that in a way of really creating idea of, are we patient enough, number one? I know our classrooms are overcrowded and I feel overcrowded, are overcrowded. How can we expand the capacity of our teachers? How can we use innovative approaches inside of the school system where if something is taking place, can they go into a program of some sort? Now I'm not in K through 12. I know people are doing all sort of amazing, but could there be an approach that is not immediate into honestly training to get into the system. Because I think that's a form of training as well. This happens, so this is the system that you go through when you do that versus thinking of it in terms of this is the training ground. And at the same time, this is the battlefield. And I'm even at war with you for you. So training ground and battlefield coming together, I cannot immediately kick you out. I cannot immediately take you out of the training, take you out of what I said that I was supposed to do, which is love, train, educate, prepare. And so for me, when I think about that, I think about, do we feel like the student is hopeless? Are we creating the capacity necessary for our teachers? And I believe that that's a, a big conversation. <laughs> and, and in that book, Dr. King also talks about how <laughs> at times the recording of the law is treated as the reality of the reform. We have a lot of laws, <laughs> but they do not mirror the proper reform. Yeah. And so we believe with law, with policy inside of the schools, are we accompanying it with reform that matters and reform that is actually doing the, the work that we want to do inside of our young people? So I would offer some of those. 
ideas. Thank you for saying that. Um, PEP is all about what you're talking about is, uh, I don't like to use re anything like the, the, because our system is, it works for some, but for a large percentage of us, it doesn't work. And I think when you redo anything, you keep some of the old, right? So you're just changing around. <clears throat> and we just need a whole new landscape. We need a, a, a new system um, because too many, too many kids are not fitting and that's what you're speaking about. And we are talking about uh, implementing some new approaches that you know we've seen work. And I think that's what happens is that, you know, you spoke earlier about uh, we get caught up in a, in a system or a cycle that because it's easier to just do what you've already done than to, to make a change. And it's funny that we ask our students to do that, but we don't model it, right? So if we don't model what we want them to do, and we know that people rarely listen to what you say, they do what they see you do. They do what you, they do, what you do, not what you say, especially kids. So we're talking about a change in how we ourselves as educators, social workers, counselors, principals, administration, how we interact, how we think. Um, and you know, you spoke, you spoke, you didn't say emotional intelligence, but that's what you were saying. And I like the way you said it because I don't, I don't have the capacity to uh, be eloquent. I think in the way you said it, I tend to be very direct, um, but you didn't lay blame on anyone. It was more about understanding that the capacity that teachers have needs to be uh, expanded the programming that's offered to them needs to be expanded. Um, there needs to be some new uh, thought processes put in place and new programming. So I appreciate your words and I thank you for what you said about that. Um, I wanna talk more a little bit about uh, what you think are some solutions for today with, with, our, with our youth, black youth in particular, um, what you think would be a start to what, what do you see as a utopia for, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go, we're going to be big with that one. Right. We, might okay. be big. we have, we, like I said, we're, we're talking now where people are saying, yeah. you know, when you think about that, that, uh, what was written, you know, being signed, you know, 1776, the executive order is is going to take out HBCUs. You know, not being funded. It's talking about not being able to speak to a black perspective, which is important because we need to see ourselves. Everyone needs to see themselves, not just you know. It's not just white. It's not just black. You need to see everyone, but you all you, you need to have a worldview. But you also need to see how important you are. So in, in a utopia, tell me what you think for our youth would be a, a good start, a good solution. Right. How, how individuals serve and how they love, it can look different. Everybody loves and serves differently. And I think that's one of the hindrances, I think for, let's say, Black Americans, we're all trying to get to that utopia that you speak of. But we see the journey and how to get there, the strategy differently. Some of us are on the Black Panther, in the Black Panther Party. Some of us was in the Southern Leadership, <laughs> you know, slick. Some of us were wanting to hop on the train with Marcus Garvey. Some of us are Booker T. Washington uh, yeah. followers. <laughs> Some of us, you know, George Washington Carver. So we're, we're all trying to get there, 
But how do we get there is the question and we all answer that differently. But I would say that if we all want that same utopia, understand that or try to figure out how can we all get there even though we disagree on the route to get there. Okay. And for me, I understand that my brothers and sisters are my brothers and sisters. And if I want to go left to get to the house and you want to go right to get to the house, you have to love me through that and I have to love you through that the whole way. The whole way. Like, you want JJ to do well? Okay, I want JJ to do well too. How can you see JJ doing well? How can I see JJ doing well? And let's Give and give and take a little bit like, OK, I don't know if we can do that, but can we do this? Are you willing to do this with me? OK, yes, I am. Now, are you willing to do this part with me? Yes, I am. And I don't know how to do that, but I believe you can be in community and have <laughs> conversations. I believe you can be in disagreement, but still be in relationship. And that's, that's how I would answer that. I don't believe that there's one cookie cutter approach. I can bring in my faith aspect and that's what gets me through day to day in working with anybody. That's what I can say. So for me, I bring in my faith perspective that no matter what, I'm gonna love and be kind to you. And my faith tells me that my goal is to love everyone and to speak up for those that are being oppressed. I don't care where you come from. That is what my, my faith tells me. Now, how we do that could differ, but I have to stand firm on that. So I believe just communicating with one another, supporting each other, even though we love differently. And I'll always stand on speaking up for the oppressed. And that's my utopia, is even though we differ, we are in love and we're trying to get to the same place. I really appreciate that answer. I really do. Um, you know, we, we, we have been talking about community schooling uh, with PEP and the understanding that you said something that was very important where it's, it's the understanding that we have, it's communication, it's understanding that you have this perception, I have this perception, but if we just talk about it, then we can work it out together and have more input. Um, you know, it, it's also important to understand to me from what you said that you, you talked about being vulnerable as an educator. And I think that's, I think that is, that's what's kind of lacking or that's where we can, we can see growth is the vulnerability as an educator as a counselor, as a social worker, to not know everything and be willing to listen and have a conversation. I think that's what, when we talk about implicit bias and we take away all of the, the negativity about it, because we all have our own bias, we have, all have our biases um, and we all have our approaches and our way we want to deal with things. And the, you, 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 you said capacity quite a, a few times, and I love that word. The capacity, we all have a, a, a certain capacity. But if we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, then we allow ourselves to, to grow and understand, and we, we, we open ourselves up to community. And I believe that's what, where we need to head with education, um, especially in K through 12, but, I think K through six is even more so because like I said, our kids model what we're talking about. Not, I mean, model what we do, not what we're talking about. So I like your utopia. I like the, the vulnerability. I like it. I like it because it matches mine personally, but um, I really like how you think. So I'm going to step on, I'm going to step back and I'm going to ask you, to give advice, one, what would you say to a white teacher 
that was dealing with our youth or youth that don't look like them? That's one. What would you say to a black teacher or brown teacher who has black and brown students that are that she doesn't agree with where they come from or you know she has an expectation of them can you can you speak to both of those for me absolutely yes i would like to ask the question to that educator whether black or white purple or green why did you answer the call on your life whatever spoke to you whatever said that you were destined to be an educator or a teacher and to have the hearts and the minds and the eyes and the ears of a young person why did you decide to do it if you decided to do it because you want to build educate love inspire motivate the next generation of leaders if that is why you did it, then keep that at the forefront of your mind. And when loving somebody and when building someone, when educating, empowering, motivating, encouraging, inspiring someone, doing those things in its title sounds very fun <laughs> to do it. I always sound like educating, empowering, motivating. I am an educator. But it is not void of pain and sacrifice and vulnerability and fear and confusion and heartache and misunderstanding and late nights. It's ingrained in every single one of those words. And when you're dealing with a human being, no matter the age, we all have to remind ourselves that when I am in relationship with you and when I'm walking alongside you on this journey, whether I'm teaching you your ABCs or about the eugenics movement, whatever, I don't know why eugenics came up. <laughs> I, I was wondering myself right here. <laughs> I was looking it up the other day because eugenics has a lot to do with how we believe in achievement and intellect. Yes. In my opinion, yes. right? So that's why I came that's up. That's where it came up, got it. <laughs> So whatever I'm teaching you, <laughs> it is not void of those things. It, it is ingrained in that. So when, as your teacher and you as the student, on the road to success, failure is on the road and it's just about at every stop. And at every stop of failure, there's fear and vulnerability. And then there's grace and accountability and then the next day, we have to have a clean slate. That that was yesterday. And we went through all of those emotions yesterday. And here we are again, Monday morning, saying, are you ready to take the walk together again? That's what I would say to any educator, is that all of those things are involved. And on the other side, because I had to answer some questions for myself in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. Are you willing to lay down your life? And when we say that, we speak to the, the transition of life, death, when we, when we hear that phrase. Yeah. Laying down my life is dying to myself. And what even that means, if you're not necessarily spiritual, but every day I have to separate how Chrisica feels with what Chrisica's purpose is and why I'm in this seat, why I, why I am in the front of this class and why I am doing this particular work. And that is how I would, would answer that question and by asking them that question is, if this is what you want to do, this is what it takes. And it takes what it takes. And it's not a fun job, it's not, it's not fun. When Friday Night Lights, the funnest thing I've ever done when I'm in education. But the other stuff that that's involved. I appreciate it. I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, I thank you for what you've said. I thank you for the work that you do. Um, 
And I thank you for just being honest, you know, with being, with being open. We talked about that before about being open that, you know, that's what we wanted, we wanted to talk about. Um, and I thank you for the suggestions and, you know, the takeaway from all of this, this conversation that I got tonight, when we talk about implicit bias really has little to do with race. It has more to do with emotional intelligence. It has more to do with understanding that just because I don't agree with the student or they're causing problems or this, that, and the other, I'm still responsible for the improvement of their life. And for all of them, not just some of them, but for all of them. And it is a difficult job and there needs to be more support. There needs to be a, a different thought process um, that our education system should be more about vulnerability and growth and community. And it's necessary for educators, uh, counselors, everyone that's involved in the system to actually take a step back every morning and let yesterday be yesterday and today be today and think about how can I empower that my whole class today, especially the ones that are not getting it. Right. And, I, and you know, and so I can say this honestly, I, I, I started off uh, with psychology and then I went to education and I did two semesters of student teaching and I knew then that I was gonna be, I was gonna do social work or psychology because it was, I didn't possess that, I didn't possess that ability to step back, right? At that time. And so I never take a teacher's job as, you know, light, lightly. Um, but again, when you said that that's what you were, if that's what you stepped up for, that's what you stepped up for. And that's what it re it takes. What it takes. Um, I really that's right. you're gonna be you're gonna be saying that now. It it takes right. what it takes. <laughs> it takes what it takes. And you know, in in all vulnerability and being vulnerable, I really don't like. I don't like doing this. Like it, it's it's fearful for me. It's fearful to me to be this vulnerable in front of a camera and to talk with people and to express how I feel. But for the benefit of someone else, it's worth it. And the more I do it, the, the easier it's getting. So, you know, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about getting rid of our implicit bias. It's the fact that the more you do it, the more you step out of your comfort zone, that comfort zone expands and you get, you, you're okay with that. So the more we talk about okay, I'm gonna not see this kid as this. I'm gonna see them as a clean slate every day. I have the opportunity to change someone's life. I have the opportunity that they may, if I know all of the things that they have and they have this opportunity to be something better because of something I did for them, it would cause us to treat each student a lot different. I think we would have, go ahead. And let me, and let me tell you this before we, we head off. I don't think that let's say my, my white sister or my white brother, we also, I think every human being every morning has two people, like they say, the two wolves <laughs> inside of them. And I think we like the, the classroom or my position as an educator, my position is a microcosm of how I am in general. Like I'm not separate from my job. No. Thank you. So, so as a human being, if, if you haven't gotten your heart broken before, tell me a secret. But we've all even gotten our heart broken. We all have had to forgive somebody. So all of that experiences is coming into my profession too. I'm bringing that into my profession. So when I have a hard time giving grace to a cousin, I'm going to have a hard time giving grace to a student. Yes. No matter. So the character trait, like they always talk about in athletics, what you learn here translates the transferable skills. We have some transferable habits. 
as human beings. So I, I don't want to, I definitely want to, to bring that up to share. We all have a decision to make every morning we wake up. Am I going to do this today? Good wolf, good wolf. Am I going to do this today? And whatever I feed is going to be the strongest. And I think all of us have to make the decision every single day, every single day. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you for being uh, a part of Pep Talk. Continue doing the great work that you're doing. Um, and the next session that we're going to talk about is going to be racial uh, equity. And it's going to be interesting. It's going to be after the election. Um, but this was a good lead in to that because we're, what we're talking about is about a wholeness and a wellness, not just for the students, but for the teachers as well. And I think that's what we're all looking for. That's what we're working toward as a country is, is wholeness and wellness and, and community. And that's the big thing I took away from what you said. So I appreciate your time today. You have a wonderful night. Thank you, Chrisica Harper, adjunct professor, professor at Concordia University. It was a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. You too, brother. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.